In our gospel lesson, Jesus offers a riddle. If you try to save your life, you will lose it. If you lose your life, you will save it. So how does that work? In my introduction class, uh, into intro to religion class at Concordia, we studied the world's monotheisms, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And in the Christianity section, we always read Mark's gospel as the, our first text. I remember on one occasion when we came to this verse, our lesson for today, one student said the following. The reason people don't want to be Christians is because Christianity tells people to deny themselves all the fun stuff. You shall not take God's name in vain. You shall not smoke. You shall not drink. You shall not dance. You shall not play cards. You shall not gamble. The list goes on. You know, the fun stuff. But actually, I think that's too easy. Jesus is remembered for doing something, he said. He isn't a savior because he didn't smoke. He's a savior because he suffered for the world. Martin Luther, I think, would agree with that sentiment. Late in his life, he wrote a treatise called On the Church Councils and the Churches, and Luther said in that document that there were seven marks of the church. The church needs seven things in order to be the church. Now, the first six are pretty normal, and I think none of us would disagree with them. The seventh one's a little bit shocking. So let me go through them all. The first one is Luther says the church possesses the word of God, which means Jesus, who is revealed through Scripture in preaching and teaching. Secondly, the second mark is that the church baptizes its members, offering the assurance of God's grace. Thirdly, the church comes to the Lord's Supper regularly so we might be strengthened to do God's will in the word, world. Fourth, the church hears confession and offers forgiveness to its flawed members so they may be restored to God and each other. The fifth mark is especially interesting this morning because we just had a meeting in which we called a pastor. And Luther says the fifth mark of the church is that it calls pastors. And we need, said Luther, well-trained, intelligent, virtuous men and women who can guide us in the way of faith and make sure that numbers one through four are done properly. Number six, the church is a place where we pray and praise God. So far, so good. Nothing out of the ordinary. Number seven, this is the unusual one. Luther says one of the most important marks of the church and the way the church is recognized in the world today is that it must suffer. A mark of the church is that we must suffer. If we do not suffer, we are not the church. Luther said the church possesses the cross. How do we do that? Back to our lesson for today, to deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow Christ. Luther also says that the reason suffering is so important is that God teaches the church through suffering to be patient, humble, gentle, and kind. In other words, to be like Christ. And so people may praise and thank God because God has turned their suffering into joy. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a pastor in World War II who lost his life because he resisted the Nazis, wrote a remarkable book called The Cost of Discipleship. And in that book he said, and he wonders at one point, what does it mean to lose one's life for the sake of Christ? He says, well, and first we must talk about denying ourselves. Now, Bonhoeffer says, really, there's two types of denial. First of all, false denial and then there's true denial. The false denial he called cheap grace. He wrote, when we receive God's grace, we are delighted that we're saved, but cheap grace stops there. It refuses to go into the world and suffer meaningful suffering. We think that suffering is doing something like not doing something, like not smoking, not drinking, and so on and so forth. That makes us holy, but that's too easy. Bonhoeffer said, no, real denial, true denial, is costly grace. Costly grace is the grace of God which costs Christ his life in the world, for it costs Christ to suffer, and costly grace helps us to take up our cross and follow jo Christ joyously to our own cross. The body of Christ 
says Paul and Bonhoeffer, in this world is the church. Jesus is physically present in the world today in the church. But if the church does not suffer, it loses its way. So then, but Bonhoeffer doesn't quite leave it there, and he says a really strange thing. He said, costly grace is hidden to the world. It doesn't really recognize it. The world doesn't understand it. It goes unnoticed, even by those who live it. And as I was trying to think of it, an example of how to make this point, I could only think of this is the best example I could come up with. Steven Spielberg is one of the most successful and greatest filmmakers of all time. I'm a big fan. E.T., Raiders of the Lost Ark, Jaws, Jurassic Park, Saving Private Ryan, and just the list goes on and on. In the early 1980s, Spielberg came upon a book by a man named Thomas Keneally. It was the story of a man that nobody had heard of. Keneally, who is an Irish author living in Los Angeles, one day happened to walk into a leather shop to buy a briefcase. While shopping, he got into a conversation with a salesperson who happened to be a survivor of the Nazi concentration camps. Keneally was curious about that. He asked how he survived, and Keneally said, oh, that's an amazing story. There's a man who saved us. So he asked him to tell him about this man, and Keneally was deeply moved by the story of Oscar Schindler. Keneally went on to write a book called Schindler's Ark about the man who saved 1,100 Jews from the gas chambers. Spielberg, who was Jewish at the same time, was doing a study in the early 1980s. He wanted to know what was being taught in our schools across the United States about the Holocaust. So what he did is he had a team of people collect all the books in the school systems of Los Angeles, Chicago, and New York, the largest school systems in the country, from across the country, and they read the books closely, and they found, shockingly, that the word Holocaust was never mentioned in them. Not only that, the book said a lot of innocent people died during World War II, but none of them mentioned that the Jews were the most that had suffered in that. Spielberg realized as he was doing this project and as he read Keneally's book, Schindler's Ark, that he had to try to bring awareness to our culture because it wasn't there. But, but Spielberg also said, was troubled by the fact that he wondered why did Schindler, who happened to be a Nazi, save these people? That was the key that drove him to make the movie. Spielberg took 10 years to make the movie because nobody wanted to make it. It wasn't going to be profitable, said the studios. Spielberg said, I don't care. <laughs> this story needs to be told. This year is actually the 30th anniversary of that film. As a young man, Schindler was, to put it mildly, a real scoundrel. He was one of the social climbers whose sole purpose in life was to get wealthy. Schindler was handsome, intelligent, highly motivated, and ready to do anything legal or illegal to become rich. Schindler joined the Nazi party and short, shortly thereafter became a member of the Abwehr, the Nazi military intelligence in part because he hoped that he, had the, he could use these connections to further his career and his own wealth. Due to his contacts, and he was right about that, he was able to buy a factory in Poland where he made pots and pans. He bribed Nazi officials so that he could win very lucrative military contracts and then eventually changed his um, factory over into making weapons for the Nazi war effort. In no time, he became extremely wealthy. I should note that Schindler was a faithful churchgoer through the war, the type of person Bonhoeffer would say had, taken, had lived a life of cheap grace. In fact, 95% of Germany, Christi Germany was Christian at the time, and most ordinary folk, like my parents, remained a part of their churches, even though their pastors took oaths to follow Hitler and, Nazi and the Nazis. Schindler on the outside was very flamboyant. He loved parties, drinking, gambling, women. Yes, he was married, but that didn't stop him. Schmoozing with the Nazis, bribing people, buying and selling luxury goods on the black market. 
Schindler's factory employed 1,700 people, 1,200 of whom were Jews. And he was glad for that because he could pay them less because uh, that was part of the law. And if anything happened to them, nobody would care because the Nazis didn't care if Jews were treated poorly. Schindler, however, suddenly began to hear rumors. Concentration camps were popping up, like Auschwitz, close to where he was. Hundreds of thousands, even millions of Jews, would eventually go to those camps and never come back again. Schindler learned from his Nazi friends that the Jews were being gassed with Cyclone B and incinerated in ovens. To this day, it's really hard to know exactly what happened to Schindler. Schindler said he was deeply disturbed when he saw the Nazis slaughtering Jews in the ghetto one day as he was riding by on a horse. He particularly noticed one little girl who was wearing a red coat trying to escape from them, and later Schindler saw her body on the top of a pile of Jewish bodies that had been slaughtered. A costly grace started to affect him, and I think probably without him really knowing it. Without changing his lifestyle, without doing anything different, Schindler, despite being a multimillionaire, decided to start spending wealth and using his influence to protect his Jewish workers. Few except the workers saw what was going on. His deeds were completely hidden from the world. The Nazis didn't notice or they would have stopped him. And I doubt Schindler fully understood what he was doing himself. But for the first time in his life, he was denying himself something and acting against his own best interests. He threw away his entire life savings, giving away everything so that he could help those that the Nazis and the Hitler called vermin. Amazingly, Schindler saved 1,100 Jews from the gas chamber. Leopold Page, the salesman in the leather shop in Los Angeles, was one of them. When Germany lost the war, Allied troops wanted to try Hitler, or excuse me, try Schindler on charges of being a war criminal. And it made sense. He was a Nazi, a member of the Nazi party. He ran a munitions factory, and he exploited Jewish workers. Schindler was about to lose his life. But Schindler's Jews stepped in, and they saved him, telling the Allies what he had done for them. At the end of the war, Schindler moved to uh, Argentina, he spent he had very little money left at all. In fact, he was penniless. He tried to start up some business ventures. They all failed. His marriage failed. His health failed. And in utter poverty, the Schindler Jews heard about his situation, and they came to his rescue. They paid for his basic living expenses, housing, and medical needs for the rest of his life. Schindler died of liver failure in 1974, and he was buried in a cemetery in Jerusalem within a plot that was given by the Jewish government. He is the only Nazi buried there. Few had heard of Oskar Schindler until Spielberg made a movie about him. Today, his grave is one of the most important tourist spots in Jerusalem. Schindler on the surface was a terrible person. He was a Nazi, a smoker, a drinker, a philanderer, you name it, it was bad, he did it. And by the standard of many churches today, he would be called a terrible Christian. But love, costly grace, a conscience, his heart moved him to deny himself. Why? He didn't even know. He lost his life and in the process saved it. All this happened in secret. When somebody after the war asked him, you know, praised him for all the great he did, his response was, no, don't ever praise me. He says, I could have saved so many more. I was a failure. Schindler's funeral was small. It was attended only by his Jewish friends and a few others. Nothing was said about the millions of dollars that he made. Nothing was said about the big factory that he ran as a successful businessman or that he was friends of powerful people. Rather, he was the man who, against all odds, saved a generation of Jews while no one noticed, right under the watchful eyes of the Nazis. He lost everything and still didn't think it was enough. There's nothing cheap about that. And the riddle of Schindler's life is the riddle that's before us in our gospel. Suffering, indeed, is the mark of the church, says Luther. 
And thus, now the last thing I can only wonder is, what will they say about us at our funerals? Amen.